existence, countless known and unknown that we have lost over the last 400 years. So one week ago, several networks of giving circles came together to ask the question, what can we do? How can we make a difference? How should we use our influence in networks to address brutality, racism, and inequality? What was birthed was an intentional opportunity to listen, learn, and act. Our first order of business was to actually hear from people doing the work on the ground. So today's webinar, a briefing from the ground, will give us that opportunity. Now, before we get started, I want to go over just a few housekeeping items so you know how to participate in today's webinar. First, we really want you to interact. So, you know we have phenomenal panelists. If someone shares information that resonates with you, please use the chat feature to share. Also, you can submit questions to our panelists. To do so, use the Q&A function at the bottom of the control panel. As time allows, our panelists will address as many questions as they can during the Q&A session at the end of the conversation. Please remember we are recording today's webinar and we will share the event afterwards. Lastly, everyone's media device should already be muted. However, just in case yours is not, please make sure that your phone, laptop, or tablet is muted to prevent background noise and unintentional distractions. As I mentioned earlier, we will hear from people who are actually doing the work on the front lines. We hope you will value this opportunity to gain knowledge from and about those who have already been engaged. They are on the front lines and what they will share today will collectively shape the actions that we will take to address social and racist, racial justice issues. We ask that you remember everyone will not have the same perspective, but we hope you will listen actively, remain open-minded, and value the knowledge shared. At this time, I would like to formally introduce today's moderator, Marcus Littles. Marcus is the founder and senior partner of Frontline Solutions, a Black-led consulting firm driven by core values of equity and inclusion. He is highly regarded in the philanthropic and nonprofit sectors as a thought leader and strategist. He has been recognized for his racial equity and social justice work, and he has also worked to redefine the way entities work together to serve boys and men of color. To know Marcus is to know that he is a natural connector and leader. He's grounded, he cares about people and the work that he does. He really actually wants the talk. Marcus is actually instrumental in the development and birth of the Community Investment Network and has remained a longtime friend, advocate, and partner since our founding in 2004. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Marcus. Thank you. Thanks so much, Marcia. Appreciate it a lot. Um, uh, at the organization that, that I have the privilege to be a part of, uh, Frontline Solutions, our, our CEO always challenges us to put relationship over issue or task. Uh, and since there's maybe about 400 of you, we won't ask you to go around and introduce yourself because that really won't work. Uh, but I do want to take a moment as a collective and, and as a community uh, to, to breathe and just to center a relationship uh, over everything. So. So I guess I'm gonna ask us to, uh, that we all together do a, do a Zoom version of what my grandmama would call touch and agree. Uh, uh, and it's, if we could just take a few minutes uh, to do, uh, or a few seconds really, to do uh, a few things. Um, if we could take 15, 20 seconds just to think about uh, like your body and how you're doing. Uh, how you're feeling, um, hurt or resolute or angry or excited, uh, tired, um, or some sort of mix. Just take 15 seconds and uh, connect with how you're doing.
if you could just take uh, a few seconds uh, to think about whom or whatever you deem to be uh, divine. It could be a person, it can be a place, it can be a faith tradition, um, but whatever you feel to be divine and connect with, if you could just take 15 seconds and, and connect with that. I think it's important that we take just a few seconds to uh, whisper the names um, of people, whether you know them or not, whose lives have been either taken or, or just constrained by, by systems of oppression uh, in this country, uh, be it the justice system, police, education, economic, health care, whatever system it is, um, uh, just take a few seconds and whisper those people's names. Rakia Boyd. George Floyd. Breonna Taylor. Trayvon Martin. And lastly, I just take 15 seconds and visualize uh, joy and what joy means uh, to you in your community, in your household, uh, uh, wherever. Uh, just visualize joy for a few, a few seconds. Thank you for touching in, in a green, uh, my grandmama, and, and maybe yours uh, is smiling, I, I, I'm sure. Uh, and thanks to CIM, thanks to Philanthropy Together for this space. Thank you uh, to each of you for living into your purpose and carrying on the tradition uh, and practice of community philanthropy, uh, a practice that many indigenous people, Black and, and other people of color have centered as part of the fabric of their cultural and uh, familial traditions. Uh, but thanks for being a part of, 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 of carrying, that, ca uh, carrying that on and carrying those traditions on. Uh, we're gonna jump right in into this briefing on, on how to uh, support black communities uh, in this moment and to collectively seek to learn and make sense about this moment in this moment in time and what it means for us. Um, our discussants have a really long list of accomplishments. Uh, and and, if, and if, we, if we went through them all, uh, then it would take the entire hour. So instead, uh, they, I do urge you to go into the chat. I see it right now. You can, uh, you can click on um, the speaker bios to learn more. And, um, uh, and so I promise they've done stuff. Uh, uh, and so you can click in, in the chat box and, 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 and check them out. Um, and so, you know, I will uh, quickly introduce each of them just with, uh, with a phrase um, uh, or, or a few words about each one of them. And then uh, afterwards, we'll, we'll pass it to them uh, to, to, to jump into uh, the conversation. Um, uh, so I'll start with uh, Morgan Shannon. Uh, and uh, Morgan, in my work with her uh, personally and professionally, she is a, a champion for Black people and Black culture always. Uh, Helly Lee, Helly Lee, who you'll hear from, she's that person in the community and in the family that, that you come to for advice and perspective. And, and perspective. Um, that's, who, that's who Helly is. Uh, Mark Philpart is a connector of people and ideas, and he is good at exuding joy even in his resistance, uh, and even when he's angry. Um, uh, and Carmen uh, Perez is a tireless uh, freedom fighter, and you hear the word freedom fighter a lot. Um, it's 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 cool to do that uh, in episodically, uh, but she's tireless uh, in always uh, fighting uh, uh, for for her people. Uh, thanks, thanks uh, for you all for 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 joining us. We appreciate you all, and so I just want to jump kick it off by asking each of you uh, the same things, right? Like if all of you could just tell us where you are 
<laughs> in the in, in in the country because uh, I think that matters local context and um, uh, your organizational affiliation and then and then you know we're all here to better understand this moment and so I'll just ask each of you to briefly like how do you describe or define this moment like what are we seeing what what are we uh, living in uh, uh, right now and um, uh, because he's joyful even when he's angry I'll start with Mark. Because, uh, you know, even if he's mad at me, he's going to smile. So if you could start first, Mark. Thank you, Marcus, for that uh, gracious introduction. I really appreciate it and uh, excited to be with all of you here today. Um, Mark Philpart, I am a managing director at PolicyLink, have been at PolicyLink since 2009. And much of the work that I do is in support of the Alliance for Boys and Men of Color. The Alliance for Boys and Men of Color is an advocacy network um, that focuses on transforming systems, failing boys and men of color, their families and communities uh, in California and beyond. Uh, we, uh, a couple of years ago, expanded to eight other states, um, including uh, New Mexico, uh, Arizona, Texas, Louisiana, Georgia, Florida, Mississippi, and Alabama. Uh, grassroots partners in those com in those communities are, are leading our work there, and Morgan Shannon and uh, Power Coalition for Equity and Justice are part of that. Um, what I want to say in regard to where we are and some of the work that we're doing is that, you know, at this particular point in time, you know, much of the work that we do is focused on uh, policy advocacy, and our primary focus um, has been uh, in state capitals, um, doing advocacy in that space um, to try and work with grassroots partners and bringing them together um, and ushering forth their vision for change in capitals uh, across the country, primarily uh, in California, where we have our deepest kind of uh, bench of expertise uh, in in California since 2011, we've advanced over 100 policies which have been signed into law and that work has been done in partnership with a whole host of people. So as Marcus said earlier, bringing people together has been really what our bread and butter has been. And uh, we've been able to drive tremendous change um, with folks because of that. And in this particular moment, you know, there's a lot of uh, anger, frustration, fear, um, and at the same time, I think people are inspired. Uh, people are inspired because uh, unlike any other moment before, there is a window and real willingness um, to talk about abolition. Um, and this is a space that uh, our organization has been moving towards over the past few years. Um, we started out very strongly in the police reform camp, I would say, you know, 20 years ago when we were founded um, and have since seen how uh, cyclical um, many of those efforts have been in that you make a reform and you still have violence and death and, and unjust murder. And, uh, you know, we're, we're now at a space where we believe uh, uh, abolition is the appropriate path for us to be on. Um, and that came because of much hard work from our grassroots partners and really trying to be in deep relationship with them. And so people feel hopeful because that vision is now a, a mainstream conversation uh, and we're excited for that and trying to do our part in order to support. Thanks Mark and, and, and as we engage more really will uh, be really interesting to hear from you about like sort of this work in the state house and this notion of abolition like what does that mean right for you know for the folk who aren't doing that work every day like sort of how is that not uh just this far out word like what's that look like you know um uh, it'd be great i think next to hear from morgan shannon uh again tell us who you are where you are and uh yeah what's this what's this moment mean like what, what what's, what's happening right now yes um hopefully you can hear me because i was having td technical difficulties earlier but um, hey, everybody, uh, I hope everybody is well and safe in these times. I bring you greetings from New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, and I also am like super culturally Christian and was raised in black church. So I also bring you greetings from my black woman led 
organization. Ashley Shelton is our executive director and has really been on the forefront of a lot of this uh, disaster recovery, equity and justice through policy change uh, work from, um, from the beginning. Um, I, I, am, I have the pleasure of being the director of strategic partnerships uh, at uh, Power Coalition for Equity and Justice, which is a statewide civic engagement table. And we work with Black folks and other oppressed communities of color um, to make sure that our people-centered policies are at the center of our elected officials' mouths and also pens. Um, our jam is people-centered policy reform. That is what we do. Um, and of course, there's other things that we do because we have to make sure that our people are well. But we are a coalition. We are an organization of organizations that are um, trying to do a pathway towards liberation. Uh, I like to listen to Ashley on a lot of panels and she does this like list of the disasters that uh, Louisiana and the Power Coalition and, uh, and our other partners have been a part of. Um, and she goes through all these lists of hurricanes, you know, Katrina, I think Gustav is in there. I should probably remember better because I've heard it a lot, but I don't remember. Um, but there's like a list, right? BP oil spill and all that. And what we know um, here at, at the Power Coalition in Louisiana is disaster recovery. And so that we know that uh, these, th this time is going to really ask um, and require that we all double down on these people-centered policies. And so that when I get to talk later, I'll talk about some of the policies that we're enacting that we've been talking about for years, but um, are really at the forefront of where we're trying to go towards liberation. So thank you. Thanks, thanks Morgan. And, and, and just, you know, uh, this, this notion of abolition and people-centered policies, I think the, the things that you and Mark are lifting up are, I think it's important for folks to understand is that this is not how, this is not the status quo, like sort of policies are not centered around people that, uh, you know, that uh, abolition is, is, is required because of, uh, you know, a, a, a uh, oppressive policies being normative and normal. And, and, uh, and, and, and so uh, it's, it's really, again, really excited for you all to unpack like sort of, you know, what movement uh, looks like. Uh, we'll go to, next we'll go to a uh, good friend and colleague, Helly Lee, who sits in a very different uh, position in space, uh, but she'll tell you a little bit more about it. Like, where are you and your affiliation and define this moment from where you sit. Hi everyone, I'm Helly Lee and I feel totally unworthy to be a part of this panel. So I feel really, um, honored to to be invited, um, but I just want to you know put it out there. I did tell Marcus I'm having a little bit of imposter syndrome <laughs> right now, but I am the community relations director for the Minnesota Department of Human Services. I um, am I grew up in the the Twin Cities of St. Paul, um, um, Minnesota, and um, and I'm also an immigrant refugee policy fellow with the Center. Of uh, for the study of social policy um, based in Washington, DC, where I spent the past uh, 13 years of uh, my life and career. Um, so, so the work that I do is, is that with the Department of Human Services um, at the state is um, to work to bridge communities with our human services system to include community voice in policy and systems change and impact efforts. And at the same time, or what I realized in my short time here is also that uh, a lot of my work is also to influence the institutional culture and practice of our agency to work toward better engaging communities and including community voice in decision making internally, right? So I think that there's this internal external sort of um, push and pull all the time of, you know, yes, we need to do a better job at engaging. And at the same time, we need to do a better job internally of doing something with what we're hearing in community. And so that is where I sit in my, in my work. And I think what I, uh, how I'm thinking about this moment is that one, we're in a really deeply challenging time. We're in the middle of a pandemic where we're seeing the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on black, indigenous and communities of color, immigrants and refugees as well, and in, in all of our communities. And, what we're seeing is that this pandemic is not only having an impact on our communities, it's also having a deep impact on our nonprofits, nonprofit sector, 
right? Many of whom are finding it very challenging um, based on capacity, on, on limited resources to address like the, the fast moving needs of communities at this time, right? So I think there's a challenge in, in thinking about like, what is this ripple effect, of the, the ripple effect of this pandemic gonna have on our communities? What does the recovery look like? Um, and what is that road ahead? And so I feel like the, the moment is very uncertain. We're in very uncertain times. And in the midst of all of these challenges, I feel like we're also in the, in, in the middle of a very historic moment, right? Where there's many potentials. And I really believe we're living in a moment where we may be able to see some big institutional and systemic changes that include community voice. Um, and this doesn't mean that the path forward to these changes will be easy or isn't without like major challenges. But I think that we have a movement and a moment, a momentum that can usher in us into this era. And we've got to really deeply commit to that. Great. Um, and, and, and this order really matters to me because I think that, you know, we'll hear from, we'll love to hear from you next, Carmen. But I think as you hear about Carmen's work, Carmen will say, like, with this imposter syndrome that Heli feels like she is, like, that Carmen's work and, and Morgan's work and, and uh, Mark's work depend on the Heli Lees being working within sort of the systems we're trying to change as allies. Like, and so, like, that organizers live everywhere. Uh, and, and, and so uh, they're a good juxtaposition next to each other. But uh, Carmen, if we could hear from you. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. My name is Carmen Perez Jordan. I am the CEO president of the Gathering for Justice, which is an organization that was founded in 2005 by the legendary Harry Belafonte, who was a confidant to Dr. King after he witnessed a five year old girl being handcuffed in her charge was that she was unruly in the classroom. And so our mission at the Gathering for Justice is to build a national movement to end child incarceration while working to eliminate the racial and inequalities within the criminal justice system. Some of the work at the Gathering for Justice, the Gathering is grounded in the ideology of Dr. King, which is Kingian nonviolence. Um, and it includes engaging artists and cultural leaders, consulting on and advocating for legislative and policy initiatives, organizing in local and national communities and cultivating and providing leadership opportunities for our young people as well as we have ongoing programming that we do on a consistent basis that include our Radical Reads, our Revolutionary Reels, which is our book club, our, um, our film series that was inspired by Mr. Belafonte and a lot of the conversations that he was having with his peers in the 1960s, as well as uh, working on campaigns around police accountability, criminal justice, juvenile justice, reform, transformative justice, uh, bail reform, and things like that. And so um, you might see us in the streets organizing marches and protests. So we use a multi-pronged approach of strategies and tactics in order to get the, the word out and bring awareness to the work that we're doing on a local level. Um, and so we also have two state-based task force, um, Ju Justice League NYC and Justice League California, which bring together uh, formerly incarcerated individuals, uh, juvenile justice, criminal justice experts, advocates, artists, to come together, what I call is to build collective power and to come together like Voltron. And so we come from diverse communities um, and utilize our combined power to build an agenda for a sustained black and brown liberation. And so what I feel we, what's happening in this moment really goes back to the 400 years of slavery that goes back to uh, the founding of this country and the consistent uh, oppression of black and brown and indigenous bodies. Um, and so I certainly am feeling uh, inspired by the way in which people are showing up in the streets. I'm being inspired by how we're seeing our young people lead um, as being somebody who was a mentee of Mr. Harry Belafonte. And I started uh, working with the gathering 15 years ago when I was a youth advocate, I'm now the bridge. I'm now kind of like, an, I don't know what I am. Sometimes I get called an elder, but you know, I'll take it. And I'm, I'm actually not an elder at all, uh, but I've been in this field for 25 years because it's personal to me. Um, I've had family members that are formerly incarcerated. And I'm also married to somebody who was formerly incarcerated. 
um, and my son being Mexican, Black, and Indigenous, um, I have to create a better future for him. And so in this moment right now, I think it's just um, a combination of things. One, it's where we are in regards to um, what has happened historically in this country, as well as the work that has happened by so many others um, that have moved the needle and the fact that we're also under COVID, uh, which kind of makes things a little bit more intense uh, than um, maybe, you know, it being easy to turn a blind eye in the past um, and not really getting involved. I think, you know, people are just, um, like I, you know, we often say we're done. I think what we're seeing is people are just saying enough is enough. And, and so Carmen, I'm gonna stay here with you for, and, 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 and ask you a question and we're gonna jump into like, uh, and, and I'm also listening to people's questions in, in, in the chat box as well. But a couple of things, like one is like, you know, why is protest, right? An important tactic for racial justice, right? Because you can't think about right now without protest and why, because it was so important that you that you centered identity, right? You talked about your own identity, identities of your of your child. Why is and why is it important to center Black folk and Black lives, right? So if you could just talk about sort of the importance of of, of protest as a tactic and why it's important to center Black people. So being um, an organizer that has kind of received the baton by an elder who walked with Dr. King, we always use a lot of the tactics of the past, but we add our own flavor. And Dr. King had said in, the le in his letter from a Birmingham jail, the purpose of direct action and civil disobedience is to create such a crisis and foster such a tension that a community which has consistently refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. It seeks so to dramatize the issue that it can no longer be ignored. And so protest is important because, and it's one of, I just want to identify that protest is, is actually one of the tactics in the overall strategy, right? Um, it gives people an entry point to be connected and be in solidarity with each other's pain and anger. Um, it gives a different level of visibility versus policy, which you're kind of working on behind the scenes. It shows the number of people who are feeling strongly about the issue. And it's also about confronting power and holding power accountable. And it gives allies the opportunity to be in solidarity. And so this past weekend, uh, we organized a march, a protest in four days with our team and about 20 uh, other organizations in New York City where about, you know, depending on who you ask, 30 to 50,000 people showed up in the streets. And we were able to put our demands, consolidate, consolidate our demands in which we had been organizing for for quite some time in coalition with some of our partners into five demands. And what it did, it brought a different level of visibility. It gave people an understanding of, you know, what we're fighting for um, and centering Black voices, centering Black bodies. Our uh, team, um, which is Justice League NYC and the Gathering for Justice, um, is primarily Black and Brown um folks and so making sure that as we were identifying what this march would look like when we were talking about the policies that we needed to identify within our broader policy agenda we were making sure that we were listening and supporting the voices of of, of the black community within our justice league family and so um it's just important for us especially because there is such a need in this moment um to show up and to show out and to also remind folks that protest is just one of the tactics um, that we use in order to achieve, you know, one of the six principles of nonviolence is, you know, um, is always to ensure that we're trying to achieve a goal and our goal has always been to protest with a purpose and even party with the purpose. It's just not about, you know, you talked about joy um, and, and making sure that we're having these very intentional conversations and to also remind folks what they're showing up for. And it is around uh, Black lives. Um, it is around making sure that, um, you know, the people that were even on our program were, it was, you know, we started off with um, lift every voice um, in our program. And, and so directing people to, to ensure that they understand what the bigger 
purpose and the bigger goal is. Uh, but there's many, and as I'm sure we'll get back into this conversation, there are many misperceptions, right? Um, yeah. About what protest is. And, and so, you know, uh, we just want to make sure that people understand that this is just one tactic. It's, it's, there's a broader strategy. There's a lot of organizing that happens behind the scenes of organizations that have been doing this for quite some time. But the protests have given a voice to the families that have also been impacted by police and community members that have been organizing on this issue for quite some time. And so if there had been no protest, uh, the officers responsible for the death of George Floyd would have never been arrested. There would have, they would have never been fired. And so this moment isn't unique, I will say. Uh, we've seen this in every generation pushing back against abuse by police. Um, and we also know that in this moment, under, like I mentioned earlier, under COVID quarantine, there have been multiple things happening that have caused to evolve in the way in which we've seen. Um, and so... That's just a little bit of, of a glimpse of, of why we feel it's important to use uh, the tactic of yeah. protest for racial justice. Yeah, and, um, and, and so Carmen, I'm gonna ask you uh, just in response to one of the questions someone asked for you to go over the six principles and, and we probably don't have time for you to go over the six principles, but um, I know you have them close by. I wonder if you could put them in the chat box. Um, but but I, I wanted to start there because you like, if there had not been protests, there would not be, and this isn't uh, saying something bad, there wouldn't be 400 people on this call, right? Like, and yes, there was outrage, right, around sort of the, like, sort of what we saw, but part of, I wanted you to demystify protests, right? Because, and, and, and also that folks sort of, there's ways in which in our giving, if we're giving to a soup kitchen, which I give to, because I think it's important, you're able to count the number of folk fed, right? Because it's very linear, but in the same way, if you're giving to and supporting protests or, or participating in protests, that there are concrete things that, across every generation that have come from that. And so I appreciate you demystifying that. And then in the spirit of continuing to demystify, you know, Mark, I want to go to you to talk. I mean, because, you know, the, you know, the, the, uh, the chat box is blowing up from your, from your remarks, Mark, because you are this policy organization, this state network, and you say, our work is about abolition. And so we have, a whole bunch of questions around, well, what do you mean by abolition? Like how is the, what is the intersection of this policy work working within the system and sort of blowing it up? Is it about defund police? There's all these sound bites. Briefly, let us know what you're talking about, sir. Absolutely. And, um, you know, much respect and, and props to, you know, organizations that have been at the forefront of abolition, of the abolitionist movement. Um, for decades, um, and so you know, critical resistance, um, you know, BYP 100, um, uh, others, you know, have been really leading in powerful ways on this. Uh, Angela Davis, you know, obviously is um, the, the 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 queen of this work and one of the key founders, but also folks like Mariam Kaba, and so we're we're really um, excited to to be building on that work and to be stepping into this space in solidarity. And for us, that has meant, um, you know, uh, a trajectory that has included, you know, reform and accountability measures and transparency. Um, but now as we step into this abolitionist space um, within the past few years, you know, we have been architecting bolder demands. Um, and so in the policy space, what does that look like? Um, well, it looks like trying to uh, work on building alternatives for complete for policing altogether. Um, how can we invest in community organizations that have deep relationships with vulnerable communities, communities of color in particular, uh, to be able to provide support and service in uh, emergency situations? And so in California, we're advancing uh, AB 2054, which is authored by assembly member Kam Lodger out of Los Angeles, which is uh, essentially trying to do that. Um, and it's making its way through the Capitol. We, we expect that you know, we will succeed and hopefully we will be able to, to get the funding as well. Um, but that bill is an example of what it could look like um, for us to center safety in our own communities. Uh, many people have heard the term, we keep us safe. 
Um, and that is what we are trying to do and facilitate in terms of um, our abolitionist kind of vision for the future. How do we create an environment and a dynamic that doesn't allow for policing and the traditional first response system to be the only option? Um, sometimes people need help um, that doesn't require somebody to come to their door with a gun or a badge. And so how do we facilitate that in the policy space? And to me, it's about how we invest, how we budget, how we prioritize our resources so that they align with our values. Um, and throughout the country, people have been calling for uh, budgets that, you know, that, that do this. Um, they've been asking for decarceration budgets like in LA, Curb and Justice LA and others have been asking for a decarceration budget. Um, people have been demanding a people's budget. Um, and, you know, cities, school districts, and states um, now have an opportunity to step into that boldly. Um, so that's what it looks like from our perspective. It, it really is about, like, how can we stop spending money on things that uh, further the systematic oppression of, of our people and really invest in uh, the community organizations and the supportive services that we know our folks need? Um, you know, policing uh, it, it has shown itself uh, to, to, to be what it is. Um, and we, we know that we're not going to find um, our way to liberation and self-determination in a police state. And so the yeah. work that we are doing is to curtail their power, to really diminish um, the ability for, for them to have the resources that they have. Um, and to ensure that people know what is happening. And so from a transparency perspective, we've done a lot in terms of, you know, really making sure people have access to records and data, uh, which is often precluded um, because yeah. the, the, the practice is such a, a strong and powerful one that there is a lot of secrecy involved. So I'll stop there, but that gives you a sense for no. some of what exists. It's super helpful. I want to make sure we, we, we I can segue to, to Morgan Helly as well. But is what's really, really important as people have been asking these questions around um, defund police, like is that what abolition looks like in, all, in these things? It's important. The first thing Mark said is this is there's a 20 year at least arc of this abolition work, right? And so people organizing, saying these things and nobody listening are, are what created the fertile ground for it to actually be considered now. So, I, so, so there's just this notion around what's reasonable, like that society was not built to be reasonable for black people. And thus, <laughs> these things that like sort of get thrown out that may or may not seem reasonable to you, it's really important that like sort of like someone is asking that question on this webinar because Angela Davis was saying it for years and years and people thought she was not. Right. Right. <laughs> That's just, and, and so there are things that get put out now that we're thinking are nuts that are going to be for, and I don't, I don't say I know the ages of everyone on the, on the call, for my grandkids, right? Like sort of people are saying out crazy things so, so they can be normalized for, for, for my kids and grandkids. Um, so yeah, so I wonder if, I, I think you're still there, um, Morgan, if, if you could also pick up on the conversation around demands, right? Like I yeah. think Morgan talked about the work that Power Coalition's done and you had a set of policy demands that you all lifted up for COVID recovery. Yeah. Then all of this stuff happened, right? But mm -hmm. your policy demands for COVID look exactly the same as your policy demands in this midst of this kind of racial justice you know, sort of moment. So can you talk about some of that policy statehouse work? Yes. Come on, Marcus, with the layup. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. <All right. laughs> yeah. So thank you. Um, I appreciate this opportunity to speak, uh, to speak with all of you all. I've worked with a lot of you all. Carmen, you have as your, I think, COO, one of my favorite people in the world, um, and also respect the architect that you lead um, here. Um, my colleagues are dropping stuff in the chat. What Marcus was laying me up to talk about is um, the roadmap to recovery um, that I will talk about, but I did want to talk about a couple of things. One of the reasons I want to make this correlation between like what you're seeing now when in the uprisings and how that can manifest into policy change, right? Um, one of the reasons why the 19 civil the the 19 the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was passed was due to a riot. 
right, that, that happened in Birmingham. We also know that policies, policy change, voting is a pathway towards liberation. There are others. Um, my colleague Carmen was talking about them earlier, right? Um, and that we also have a lot of progressive elected officials, many who look like me and will still uphold systems and policies that continue to suffocate Black folk. And um, I say all that to say that holding elected officials accountable um, to people and not racist systems and corporations is a central tenet in what we do. And that all of our fates are, uh, they are all combined. And if we, we either recover together or we don't recover. So like Margaret was talking about, beginning in the pandemic, we assembled our troops, our partners, and we said, now is the time. They have been talking about all of these things that was like the kind of safety net that wouldn't have gotten us into the place that we are in now. They've been talking about it for years. Um, and we said, okay, like now is the time we have the microphone now because folks are seeing how this, what happens when we have a lack of a social safety net. And so we developed the policy guide. The Power Coalition for Equity and Justice is a statewide coalition. We know that between the many, there are a few. Um, I don't know if you can see our logo, but it's the state of Louisiana with like a fist almost in the middle. Like there's power behind the punch. We were already kind of talking to folks, gearing up for legislative session and things like that because we knew it was going to be a fight and then COVID hit. Um, and we said, okay, like this is the time we have the microphone, let's start, let's start talking. And so over 30 partners and counting because our policy document, which is in your chat, is a living document. And it was co-created with almost 30 organizations. And it talks about immediate needs and also talks about long-term safety nets. It talks about housing crisis and um, rental assistance and making sure that the unhoused are housed. It talks about compassionate releases and making sure that people get out and are not arrested for minor offenses, right? Working with our partners at Vote and other places. It talks about not caging our babies, right? A lot of the work that the Justice League does, but we have a partner here um, called Flip. Um, Gina Womack, a Black woman sent a leading network, right? And we've seen some wins too, because I do think that we should celebrate the wins. A lot of times, like we're so in the fight and we know that there, there are many things to fight. We feel like we're getting jumped and we can't just necessarily celebrate like, okay, well, I really did just beat that person up, right? And so we have some wins. We, we, we were able to um, take a balanced approach to resolving the budget. Um, and find creative ways to use federal dollars. We were able to expand early voting, uh, eviction delays, even though I think they're about to be turned off, but we putting the pressure on the folks and, um, and working with our partners. Utility shuts off, utility shut off, unemployment for gig workers, which y'all know is big here in Louisiana. You know, you like to walk down these streets and be hearing folks playing in the streets or even go to these little bars and things like that. And we know that gig workers are big here in Louisiana. Um, and so we, we have celebrated some wins, but we're in this for the long haul. We know that there's, it's going to be a fight. The good thing about this is that we know a lot about disaster recovery. Again, I talked about the top of the call, our executive director, Ashley Shelton, is basically exec, uh, a disaster recovery specialist. You know, everybody is kind of like in her inbox talking about, please, you know, get on this call, help me inform this. And, you know, and we try to send the invoices too, because we need to play black women for their labor. <laughs> um, and then the other thing too is like, Ashley, and I, I, I love this, she talks about the big P, right, which is the statewide stuff and the, and the local P. Um, the sanitation workers, I want to just lift that up. They have been on strike here in New Orleans since May 5th. Um, and just asking for just um, just humane things, fight, you know, um, a good uh, paid minimum, uh, paid, sorry, New Orleans passed a local minimum wage, right, um, five years ago. And the, the sanitation workers were asking for hazard pay. They were asking for access to PPE. They were asking for the hydraulic acid that comes from the trucks and not burn them. And so they were just asking for these things. Power Coalition was there at 20, in 2015 passing that New Orleans ordinance to make sure that um, there was um, a living wage and they're not even getting paid that due to third parties and contractors and things like that. And so what we're doing is we're trying to hold elected officials, elected officials accountable to have some, have some power be, be 
beyond the performative, like Black Lives Matter, oh, let's make sure that people are okay. Marry that with your policies, right? Mm -hmm. Going on the performative politics, right? We need to make sure that our people are well, and we need to use your power of your pen to make sure that's okay. Um, Let me jump in real quick, yeah. uh, Morgan, because I want to make sure, because we have questions coming in, but I want to do a couple things, like, right? Like, one is to just preview for everyone that, like, this is a briefing and we're kind of letting you know what's happening. And next week on, on, on the call, like we're gonna like really talk through what you can do. But, I, but while we have some folk here, I wanna make sure like they're, they're, we, we didn't just get a set of people from Minnesota. We, you know what I mean? Even though that has been like sort of like what, what broke the levy, I guess, right? Around the, the, uh, uh, all over the country. But we do think folks should understand if you want to support or be connected or where should you get your information to understand what is actually happening in the Twin Cities, right? Um, and so, Helly, could you speak a little bit around the work to fight for sort of black communities? To what does the racial justice fight look like in Minneapolis, in St. Paul, so folk on the call can be connected to that? And then we'll take some more questions. So I do want to acknowledge there are many folks on the ground who are much better um, um, folks to be speaking on this topic specifically, but I, I do want to, you know, just provide just a quick background on Minnesota uh, as, a, as a state. I think that gives a lot of context into how we ended up here, here where we are uh, today, right? And Minnesota is a progressive state and behind that progressive progressivity the Minnesota, and the Minnesota nice culture, there's a different story. And it is well known that while Minnesota and the Twin Cities in particular, because um, uh, it's very different from the Twin Cities to the broader Minnesota uh, as a state, um, consistently rank high as one of the best places to live in the country. But it is also well known in Black, Indigenous, and communities of color that this is not true for everyone, right? So in fact, in 2018, there was a report that shared that the Twin Cities rated, rated number four in a list of worst uh, cities for Black Americans, citing that the cities are highly segregated by race and has some of the largest disparities in poverty, income, and home ownership between Black and white residents of any U.S. metro area, right? I think those, that's an important context to sort of put in here because we think, oh, Minnesota is very progressive. And these disparities run deep into the city's histories, right? So for example, covenants in the early 20th century embedded, property, embedded in property deeds prohibited, prohibited people who were not white from buying or even occupying land, right? Another example is the placement of a major highway that cut across a tour through a thriving black community in St. Paul, displacing hundreds of people and, um, um, and businesses, many of which never reopened or recovered from that, right? Those have long lasting impact. I think you, Marcus, you talked about the intergenerational impact of policies and, and efforts. And this is a huge example of that. So like while um, communities have been raising these issues and the need to address historical trauma and disparities um, and the disparities between uh, racial ethnic communities and white communities in Minnesota, our efforts thus far have, have um, fallen short, right? So what we see right now is the culmination of a long history of black indigenous, in, indigenous and communities of color enduring unjust and inequitable policies inequitable policies and practices that contribute to the widening gaps. Um, and you couple that with the tragic killing of George Floyd, right? The murder of George, George Floyd that has called so many across, not just the Minnesota, but the country and the world to take action, right? To really just sort of to, uh, um, take action to uh, look at the injustices that we all perpetuate. And I think what, what is happening in Minnesota um, also, uh, it is important to note that Minnesota is home to a vibrant nonprofit and philanthropic sectors, right? These are critical players in the fight for equity and more equitable justice systems. And we have long had leaders in Black, Indigenous, and communities of color and community-based organizations who have been bridge builders and advocates for the betterment of our communities. And you, you recognize these names, right? Some of them are the local NAACP and Urban League Children's Defense Fund, right? Um, but others are smaller community-based organizations that are not as recognizable, but are just as critical, right, into, in the community. Black Immigrant Collective, Northside Achievement Zone, Insuru, right? Many others who have long worked in communities to address community needs. And in this moment, I think what we are also seeing is the leadership and the voice of emerging generation of leaders leading the effort to drive change, right? Some of whom are affiliated with organizations, 
some are collaboratives of organizations across racial and ethnic communities, some are business and business owners, volunteers, neighbors, community organizers, right? And I think one of the names that really rise to the top when we talk about like who's doing the work um, in the Twin Cities is Reclaim the Block, right? Reclaim the Block uh, was started in 2018 to organize the Minneapolis community and the city council to divest money from policing toward areas of the city's budget that promote community health and safety, right? And, and others uh, like uh, MPD 150 who have been at the center of this movement um, in, in Minnesota. And I think uh, with these recent um, activities that, you know, like we're sort of uh, rising up in, into the news in the past couple of weeks, Reclaim the Blacks has received an outpouring of support from the community recently. And I'm going to put a link into the chat box here of, you know, of, of a list of organizations that they're also lifting up, right? So it's like them saying, hey, you know, we've received a lot of uh, support lately. Here's a group, here's a whole list of over two dozen other organizations, individuals, groups that are also doing this work for the broader movement. And I think this is an, uh, a moment for those of us who work in these formal systems to really be paying attention to how community work is being done and how communities are organizing themselves and what we need to be changing within ourselves. And I think here, you know, the question was, who, who are the, who's doing the work on the ground? And I think, Marcus, to that, my answer is that, you know, there are many great organizations on the ground doing the work. And there are also many uh, great community groups, businesses, individuals, places of worship, less, you know, sort of formal sort of networks that are doing the work on the ground in a collaborative way that are not set up as formal entities. And I think the challenge for us, I think, is, you know, in particular as a, being a person from within a system that, you know, perpetuates many of these disparities, is how do we support this ecosystem of community supports, right? Many of which don't look like what we're used to, not, for all, not all 501c3s, not, you know, some of them um, where folks are donating to individuals who are running around town grabbing food and donations and, you know, to, uh, bringing them to the places where they need to be. So I hope that answers your question. Yes, absolutely. And we will like sort of in prep for next week, you know, you know, like take some of the organizations that, that Heli lifted up in Minnesota, right? As well as the base building partnerships that that with Mark and that that and that um, Carmen, like her partners, that you know, sort of power coalition has a set of partners in Louisiana all over the South. Like this is big picture, but if you also want to know who can I support and we're in this place, we're going to try to answer that question for you, like from our humble sort of network. Um, we are going to pass this to um, Sarah, I believe, to take care of some things. And then our panelists said they'll stay around for another 15, 30 minutes, you know, just to continue to have this conversation. But we want to make sure for folk who are, who are, who are going to drop off that you get some of the preview for, for next week. Sarah and Marsha. Thank you. Thank you, Marcos, Sanjali, Carmen, Mark, Morgan. Thank you for all your insights and your ideas and the ways of taking action. We're extremely grateful for your time and your deep experiences on these issues. Thank you also for being, you know, chatting all those links of resources for all our Given Circle leaders and members. Um, again, I'm Sara Lomelina. I'm the founding ED of Philanthropy Together. We just launched a couple of months ago and, you know, being able to rally uh, a dozen Giving Circle networks and hundreds of circles around COVID first and now for this racial equity response has been extremely, extremely powerful. And I am very humble of, and grateful for all the, you know, 368 people on the webinar right now. Um, I just wish we could see each other. And uh, we're almost at the hour. I want to be very respectful of your time. I want to just leave you with three very important things. If you are new to the Giving Circle movement, welcome, first of all. And uh, join a Giving Circle, start your own, learn more. There are so many ways to get involved and would love for you to reach out to me and to my team. Our world right now needs all of us given and given intentionally and bridging divides and joining together. Our email is being chatted right now. Uh, tomorrow we're launching our first um, Giving Circle incubator called Launchpad and we're starting 40 new Giving Circles. Uh, second thing, 
if you're a Giving Circle leader, member, or anyone in between, don't forget to sign up for next Monday's part two webinar. Marcos will be back and he will be leading us through a very much uh, more personal conversation about how you as collective giving groups can take action. Um, and you know, for the long-term philanthropy together and CIN at the helm, uh, we're putting together an ongoing community of practice for any given circle that wants to engage a lot more deeply over the next six months. And you'll learn more about that next Monday. And the third and the most important thing that I want you to, to leave with is that we should give together right now. As Giving Circle and Collective Giving Advocates, you already know the power of what we can do together, uh, the power of our collective. I mean, we are everyday givers and everyday givers can do so much together. So this could be the first action that the entire Giving Circle field is doing you know, all together. Um, the over 350, 368 people listening right now, if everyone on this webinar will give what is significant to you, $10, $100, $1,000, I bet we could raise tens of thousands of dollars right now. Um, my team is chatting a donation link to a pool fund on Grapevine, uh, a platform for giving circles and pool funds. The organizations you heard from today, plus our co-host CIN, will receive an equal split of any funding that we receive today with nothing removed. And I know that by showing up for this call, you have probably donated already, but I'm asking you to give again. I think this moment requires that of all of us. If you learned something today, if you were moved by something today, got inspired today in any way, or got really mad by something today, I urge you to give to these organizations right now. Um, institutional philanthropy, you know, can sometimes move slowly, but we as individuals can move very, very quickly. And all together, we can liberate funding right now. So um, I want to email you at the end of the day and share how big our collective grant could be and help me make that big number. So thank you again to Marcos and Mark and Carmen and Morgan and Heli and Marsha. And they have agreed to stick around for the next 15 minutes to answer more questions. And we hope to see all of you next Monday. And I'm going to stop now. Marcos, I turn it back to you. Uh, sorry, that's amazing. Thanks. Thanks so much. Uh, I'm not going to like jump into anything. I, I really want to get to some of the questions we didn't get to. Uh, and, and so one question we can sort of answer really quickly is this, this question around, you know, if, if, if we have relevant experience dealing with, you know, primarily white groups or giving groups. Um, and I think, and, and I think the answer to that, I'll just say really quickly in terms of if, 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 if folk are, trying to figure out what to do i do think like you know uh that that the pace of the urgency of this moment can't be informed by what well, our entire giving group has gone through unconscious bias like we've, we've done all this internal work and now we understand it all we've made a minute for the past and so we'll we figured out our theory of change of what to write a check for i will say or where or where to put our time and our talent and our and our treasure what we will say is there are black led groups and organizations and campaigns in every community. And we would say, start there, right? And if that is outside of your relational circle and you want to be connected to or to their work, we can help that. <laughs> we, can, we can on this phone help with that, but I, I, let's, let's not hold these black led groups who've gotten underfunded to a higher bar right uh then we do others and so 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 one so and and so that getting the giving circle to even say it's really important that part of who we support aren't just institutions that support black and brown folk but are led by them is a is is a incredible place to start as a principle right that we are going to support and and be a part of supporting institutions that are that are led by um black and brown folk um so another question that I wonder, uh, and, and whoever can speak to it, uh, you know, I think it was it was named for you, Mark. Uh, you know, others, you know, uh, could could weigh in. You know, a lot of stuff is trending, right? Like on social media, et cetera. And this 
and and one of the things that gets talked about is the the eight can't wait piece like sort of and and so someone really and i think this is a really important question right like sort of there's this social media conversation around a campaign called eight can't wait for folk who may not know about it that the a set of organizers have done and so mark maybe and and others maybe weigh in on what you think about it but more importantly how do folk sort of like uh how do you sort of make sense of the no like i won't say the noise the different proposals that are put and 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 are trending like sort of where do you go to make sense of it right like sort of uh i think it, although that's a hard question mark and others but like that's that was one of our questions so it's yours you're the talent i, I appreciate that uh thank you for passing me that hot potato marcus and uh <laughs> You know, I, I'm a, I'm sure that uh, lots of folks have uh, ideas and thoughts on this. Let me just say that um, we take our direction first and foremost as the Alliance for Boys and Men of Color, um, and we're getting better at this as an organization overall at Policy Link. Um, we take our direction from grassroots leaders um, and people who are risking their bodies, um, their lives, and their livelihoods. Uh, in this principal struggle, um, in direct action, um, in you know the uh, spaces where um, you know liberation is uh, an afterthought for a lot of folks and a lot of communities, right? Where you know there is such great oppression and uh, despair, um, where people don't have the ability to dream, right? And so you know people who are working in those spaces and those communities are the people who we um, actively try to seek leadership from around our direction and what we are trying to do, and people who have a deep-seated um, uh, expertise and understanding of abolition and how we walk down that path. And so, um, you know, the debate that you are seeing happening right now over social media, and I've, I've seen glimpses of it, but I'm not on social media, and that's intentional. I'm uh, one of the last holdouts is that, um, you know, I think you have people who have this put out this grand vision for abolition and for, you know, defunding police and really trying to dismantle systems of oppression. And then you have um, a set of reforms and policies that have been amplified because lawmakers are scrambling to try and find out what they can do in the moment that would uh, alleviate some of the pressure that they feel. And so rather than heeding the demands of people on the ground who have asked for abolition and defunding, they have you know, really taken hold of you know, a can't wait and the set of reforms that are being advanced there. Um, now in any other context um, other than this one, that might have been okay, um, but the, the demands that are being asked for right now um, are to defund and dismantle the police. And um, to do anything else is, um, uh, you know, is, is dishonest and not uh, aligned with where people are at on the ground. And I think this is a problem of movement alignment and movement politics where people um, uh, uh, are so uh, set on having the right answer or the scientific analysis um, that would support their being right or their being a leader in the field um, that they are put they put themselves in a position where they're not aligned with people on the ground and I think that um, you know, it's a it's a it's a lesson to us all, especially those of us who are at intermediary organizations or organizations that work um, across communities throughout the country. Um, you know, to to be cautious about how we lead and lead in a way that is in support and getting behind and reinforcing the work of people who are who are you know risking it all, and not try to um, you know develop unique proposals that are smart and maybe, you know, kind of absent any context could actually be right. But, you know, th this, th the world we live in is contextualize um, the, the fights that we are immersed in. And so we can't um, get into this work in a way that is a historical or a contextual. We have to be doing it in a way that allows us to be guided by a set of principles and um, that is aligned 
with uh, people who are are doing the hard work. So that's yeah. that's what I'll say there. And yeah. I appreciate all parties involved. It's just a it's a very difficult um, challenge to wrestle with. And yeah. I think the alignment piece is is huge. You know, and Carmen and, and Morgan have been doing this work a long time, right? Like, in every movement is a movement of movements. And so there's just like this this way in which movement leaders, frontline folk on the ground are held to a higher standard than Congress is, right? Like sort of folk can't agree on Congress, like it's like, in, whether it's Democrats or Republican or what, like sort of like th there's always this haggling to come up with something that usually is a watered down policy. Like that's how, that's what compromise is. Movements is the same thing. And so like whether it's eight can't wait or others like that, there is not a way <laughs> there's not this right thing like and, and and so like the critique is probably valid but it doesn't make the campaign invalid <laughs> right like and so Carmen uh, you know this is your work and so yeah you know, so you one of the things that I, I feel I am I am the bridge right I'm the bridge between the elders and the youth I'm the bridge between those that have access and those that don't I'm a bridge I've always been a bridge. I'd known I've been a bridge. I've been a bridge for 25 years, even though I, I, I used to be the youngest in the space for a long time, but I knew what my role was. And what I would say in regards to the criticism is that there's a lane for everybody, right? I am of the belief that there's a lane for everybody. We need the folks that are working on policy. We need the folks that are on the ground. Some of us do it all, right? <laughs> I could say, I think everybody in, in this space right here probably does it all. Like I take out the trash, I deliver, I organize a, 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 a march that brings out 5.2 million people on the day after the inauguration. I work on the policy. I work on bringing in the artists, the program. I also help build the stage, right? But what's important here in this conversation is the fact that like protest, again, is a, we have to be reminded that it is one of the tactics. And what I want to say, the reason it's so important to bring this visibility of mass mobilization um, and, and allow people to come together with their righteous anger is because there are results. On Saturday or, or last Sunday, um, and Donise will tell you, um, Donise is our COO, you know, we, we, we were going back and forth about, you know, how do we condense some of our policies to put them together for demands? Um, on, on, that was on Sunday, that was my husband, myself, an individual by the name of Mandela who works uh, with my husband at California's for Safety and Justice and ASJ, as well as used to be part of Communities for Police Reform in New York. And then on Monday, we got together with our team, which is about 30 people, um, and, and said, you know, we want to make sure that this centers Black voices. And so we want the folks in our, in our family in Justice League and the gathering to tell us what it is that we need to be pushing, right? What do we need to be organizing? And on Saturday, we had the march. On Sunday morning, the mayor went over all our demands and said what he was going to do. And so at this moment, as I'm on this call, I'm, I'm texting my folks, right? Because there's a vote that's happening right now. And I'm telling you, this is years of organizing. So I hear what Mark is saying. It's important to center and to connect with the organizations, the individuals, right? The people that have been on the front lines, that have been organizing. That ha This is not new. We haven't been working on Repeal 50A in New York since, you know, last Saturday. We've been working on it for years, right? We've been working to ensure that all officers involved in the killing of unarmed or, or just people in general be held accountable, right? We, we've, been, we've been requesting these things. And so, but what I will say is there's a lane for everybody on this call, right? Whether you're giving, whether you have social, we need folks to, to help put together stages. I don't know how I was able to like say, okay, we need the stage here. We need graphics here. I'm not an artist, you know, I'm a bridge. But again, there's, I want to remind folks that it's important to put policy uh, priorities out but it's also important to connect to the people because oftentimes, like Mark said, um, you're putting things out that just are not in alignment. And, may, and, and that's why you always have to have, um, and I'm not for like bringing on uh, folks to do diversity and inclusion and then you give them to look over your documents. I think it's important to make sure that black, you support black leadership 
that you support brown leadership, that we follow black women, right? And and certainly, you know, doesn't say anything else about, about anyone else, but, but in our space, we certainly support the work of black women and making sure that they feel supported, that they feel seen, that we're not imposing more or, or, or having them carry a, a bigger load than they have to. And so sometimes that means some of us allies, right? Like me being Mexican American, being Chicana, um, have to take a little bit more of that load from them. And so, you know, I just wanted to share that because it's important, especially when you have so many people on this call that could certainly play their role, not just by giving, but by giving their talents and their expertise to the movement. We're always willing to accept that. And that is abolition. Right, like I mean, <laughs> like that is abolitionist in in in, in and of itself. Mm -hmm. That because that is not how these structures um, work, right? And 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 so it's just it I, 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 it really is, it, you know, I really want to import the fill on the call. Like if you like if if this is doing exactly what Carmen said in terms of like supporting black institutions, supporting black and brown institutions, supporting black women. If that is not if that is if that is not what you do, I am saying put as much effort in figuring out well how can we do that yeah. as we put in effort into dissecting the validity of of eight can't wait right like I think there's ways in which like some stuff is hard but some stuff isn't right it, it it's and and you know and and it doesn't speak of 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 who you've been or who you are, whether you have been supporting those institutions, this is a moment where you can, right? And, and I think that's um, uh, really, really important. Go ahead, Morgan, you were jumping in. Oh, no, I was just, you know, I was in the amen crowd, sorry. <laughs> and my, yeah, but um, I, uh, one thing I would, would say is it's okay to be able to give and not necessarily understand what you're, you're giving to, right? <laughs> but to just trust that the people who do understand are going to lead us into the way um, that we need to go, right? And so, you know, I know that people are like, but what about this and what about that? And I really can't reimagine those systems and I don't necessarily really know what it's gonna look like on the other side. And what we're asking you to do is, we know what it's gonna look like on the other side. We knew this was gonna happen. We knew all like all of these things were going to happen, and that's why we were de developing these, you know, people-centered policies, listening to folks out on the ground. And so it's okay to not to give and give unapologetically, and not necessarily know what's going to be on the other side. That's what we call trust in Black women. Okay, shake your head, Mark. Shake your head, Marcus. Okay, <laughs> like this is this is what this, this is what we do, right? Um, and we also understand that at the end of this some of the abolition work is to just unapologetically give and then just kind of sit and reap the benefits, right? Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about is, you can't see my shirt, I know y'all can see my earrings, but you can't see my shirt, it, it says, ask me about the census. There's still going to be work, though we know we're getting a lot of um, attention about the, the, the things that are happening in the world and we should, there's still things that are happening every day to folks that we still are going to be able to have to do. The census is one of those things, right? We are really working here in Louisiana to make sure that all people are accounted. Like we're even looking at the data and looking at hard to, hard to count um, populations and correlating that with um, something that we're going to be doing in 2021, which is redistricting. There are still things that we need to be able to fight, just everyday things that pre-pandemic, pre all of these uprisings and things like that, we're going to be fighting and post we're going to be fighting too. And so what I would just offer to you all is trust the process. Okay, like we really know what we're doing, like Carmen has been saying, other folks have been saying, we've been doing this for a long time. We already know all the talking points. We already know what each other was going to say on this call. I already knew what Mark was going to say. I already knew what Carmen was going to say. And I ain't never met her. You know what I mean? I already knew what Haley was going to say because we've been talking about it for a very long time. And so, yeah, you're like, oh, maybe, you know, before everything seemed, seemed well. No, it wasn't well. But now we have an echo chamber. We have an ecosystem to 
be able to do this work and do it unapologetically. And so, yeah, if you're not inspired by this whole word that y'all been listening to on this call to unapologetically give, like Sarah was talking about, I don't know what's going to inspire you. Okay. <laughs> but I just wanted to say that um, while I was amening you, Marcus. Oh my goodness. So, so thank you, Morgan. Uh, 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 Mark Philpark has to go and save the world. We appreciate you, Mark. Um, I just wanted to like sort of, uh, you know, give, give, give Heli a closing word. I mean, I think one thing around Heli is like Heli, Heli has, she said she worked at Policy Tank. She, she's worked at the White House uh, and uh, un, under Obama administration and, and, and she's worked in uh, organizing sort of API work and API sort of black solidarity work. She's been a consultant. She's worked in government. And so there's a way in which uh, against her personality, right? Tell me if I'm wrong, Heli. Heli has had to like sort of learn to sort of just deal with the complicated, right? Like it's not linear, like the like sort of, is this institution gonna do it right? And so there's a messiness that, sh that, that the work she's chosen has made her get good at. And so all she does is take risk and organize from where she is. And so like any closing, you know, words from you, Heli, because yeah. you, you're the one person sitting in government and sitting in Minnesota. And so like you just hear and hold this stuff in a different way, I think. Yeah, I think it is really a, a really tough place to be when you're from community, you, you are part of a community and then you're part of an institution that sort of perpetuates the disparities that you see in the community as well, right? And I always say to folks that when I talk about uh, change, it is very personal for many of us in these systems because um, it is not just about our jobs or we didn't just study to be in there, but that it is also very personal um, for us. And I think that what I, what I do want to just echo, uh, you know, what Carmen, Carmen said is that there's a lane for everyone. I think I want to, I want to just sort of raise that in many, in many of our communities and non-Black communities of color, we're also being called to do the work within our own communities and our own families to discuss and address, hold space, to have these discussions around anti-Blackness, right? What does collaboration, what does standing in solidarity look like? What does it mean for us as communities of color, many of whom are also experiencing our own challenges within our communities and the disparities to be standing in solidarity, to be centering Black voices and Black leadership at this time, right? And so I think that I'm really excited to be seeing some of those very challenging conversations, many of our community leaders who have received death threats for, for standing in solidarity, right? And centering this conversation. And I, I think that it's, a, a, although very scary for many individuals, it's also a very exciting time for us uh, in communities of color to, be, to color to be addressing some of these. And I think I also wanna highlight that like there are many efforts even you know, there's an effort called Letters for Black Lives where volunteers are translating letters in many, many different languages so that young people can have conversations with their elders, right? And these are things that, you know, uh, we often don't think about until we're at, at a place like this where we're like, how do I talk to my mom about centering Black Lives, about like Black mm -hmm. Lives Matter? I don't have the vocabulary in my own language to have this, this conversation. My mom doesn't know how Black people were brought to the, this country, right? And those are conversations that, you know, we, we were only able to have very initial uh, scratch the surface on and we couldn't get deeper into like this, the conversation around systemic and policy challenges that have, that have perpetuated these dis disparities that have oppressed uh, Black communities and how we as communities of color have benefited from the, the movements that have come before us in black communities, right? And so I just wanna, you know, just echo those of, of, of the other panelists that like, you know, this is really work that is falling on all of us um, to be centering uh, black narratives, black lives, black leadership, or black women leadership uh, at this time and really excited to be a part of this conversation and this movement going forward. You all, thanks so, thank you so, so much. Uh, Carmen had to jump, um, uh, you know, she's navigating uh, a whole lot. Um, uh, this was amazing. I hope everything went well. Just so, Heli and, and, and Morgan, I need you all to, to let people know that, uh, I need you to let my wife know that I put on a collared shirt because she made me come with a collared shirt so I wouldn't embarrass her in front of her friends uh, hey. who are Morgan and Heli. Please tell her. <laughs> um, everyone else, please, please come next week and we can really jump in what you can do as best we can, right? And, but we won't answer, be able to answer all your questions. Like it'll be a leap of faith to figure out how to like sort of support the people doing the work. Marsha, Sarah, everyone, thanks for 